Hey guys, welcome back to J-Hood Creative. Now, I've got a story to tell. This is my biggest hunt, prize winning haul of all time. And it's, it's a bit of a long story. I know my videos have been lasting about a half an hour. I don't want that to happen, but can't make any promises uh, that I, I'm not going to go that long or longer. I'll try, I'll do what I can to make it go as quickly as possible, keep the pace, keep the excitement going. And uh, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to leave this on, lead you on any longer. Let's just get into it. So anybody that's familiar with my channel knows about Uncanny X Men 136. Talked about it hashed about it um, it's my opinion greatest single comic ever it's kind of subconsciously the one comic I compare everything else to on some level that's true it was my first X-Men comic um, but kind of goes hand in hand with another comic another X-Men comic and that's Issue 138. So, I had bought the 136. I was like, this is pretty good. Next time at the store, I'm flipping through the spinner rack, seeing what I'm going to bring home next time. And, what well, do you know? There's another issue of x on the rack, just like there was with Batman or Superman or any other comic I might have bought back in the day. But, so, this issue left off with a cliffhanger. This issue kicked off with... Dun, 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 dun. As they say, miss a little, miss a lot. Something dramatic had happened. Something that didn't happen in comic books. A superhero had died in the issue between these two. Now, luckily for me... This issue is like, it tells the whole history of the X-Men. So I jump in at just the right spot, miss the big climactic ending, but then I get a recap of everything I missed up to this point. You know, like, you ever watch an old TV show back in the 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, they do these flashback episodes where it was like a clip show where they'd go over all the stories of all the episodes that had led up to that particular one. You didn't really find much new, but it was fun to kind of relive the glory days, right? That's exactly what this comic did. So, I immediately understood the history of the X-Men, and it was pretty darn cool. <laughs> Funny thing. Right there. There's an ad for 137 in this book. So I noticed that. I was like, oh, that's that, that's that one. And I remembered seeing it on the rack. When I, once I got home, I remember, remembered seeing it. So, I don't know why I'm looking through this. So, I was like, i, I got to go back to the spinner rack. Maybe there's a copy left. And I kind of begged Mom to take me. We went within a few days, got back there, there weren't any copies left. So I was pretty bummed. This Now remember, no comic book shops back then, at least not in our neck of the woods. Um, if you wanted an old comic book, you had to go to a garage sale. It was going to be hit or miss if you would ever find something you're actually looking for. So I was lucky enough, I had this comic... Um, read through it, but then I kind of got to the end, and I was like, it says, right down out there in the corner, Kitty Pride arrives at the mansion to become an official X-Man, and it says, the beginning, and for some stupid reason in my little 11-year-old mind, I thought, Oh man, that's the end. 
I, I got in at the wrong time. They're, they're, this, they're not, there's not going to be an, an next issue. And usually they say the end. That one says the beginning. And I was like, oh man, that's, that kind of, kind of bummed me. So, what about my business? <clears throat> Over the next year, and went and bought comics as usual. And I was always kind of bummed that I would never find any more X-Men. And about a year later, I was like, they didn't cancel it? So I picked this one up. Okay, so Dave Cochran's comic book master. John Byrne was the first creator, first name I ever learned as far as the creators of comic books. And he was awesome. He was great. I don't want to say Dave Cochran paled in comparison, but being used to John Byrne and then going to Dave Cockrum, and it was like, I didn't know the difference. I didn't know Dave came first. It's kind of a, a, a shallow comparison, John Byrne to Dave Cockrum. Again, I was 11. I didn't know any better. I didn't know to respect your masters. So, started buying it. Got it monthly from then on. Pretty much up until this day. There have been two times that I can count that I stopped buying X-Men. Everything else I bought pretty much up until just say a couple years ago. Where they did all this blue, red, yellow, gold, black, white, all the colored full X-Men comics. I was like, I'm, I'm off. Give me give me some quality. I'll, I'll come back and I'll come back for the Hickman stuff. So the same month I bought this issue, the X-Men, I also picked up Teen Titans 10. And the next month we went on a summer vacation and we we're at some tourist trap kind of town and we stopped to get some gas and across the street there's a place comic book store it's like oh like the lights would like shine out of the windows across the street right in my eyes i was captivated i was like mom dad we got to go over there so they, they were kind enough to take me over got to get it go in look around there were long boxes there were shelves with comic books on the shelves. They had books up on the wall. I don't know what they had, but the one thing they did have was an X-Men 137. I was like, oh, it's the one. It's the one I got to have. Mom, Mom, can I buy this $9 comic book? no hope so I had to sell for Teen Titans number 11 which ain't half bad it ain't X-Men 137 but this got me collecting Teen Titans until well after George Perez left the book Marv Wolfman I think was still on I want to say there were other writers involved I can't remember but they got got bad in the 90s um the next year we went on another vacation I picked up Daredevil but I wasn't a steady Daredevil reader this was like the only issue I bought really I liked it but I don't know buying off a spinner rack is kind of hit or miss and it, it might have even been a day where um, some stores like stopped carrying comics maybe that, that happened along the way um, a store would stop carrying comics two years later they'd have comics again you'd have to go to a different grocery store to find your comics so it's kind of hit or miss so when X-Men 136 came out I was 10 years old 11 years old so when I was about 14 or 15 at my cousin was getting married and as most people do kids get drug along the weddings right and his cousin's wedding and um, you know mom wanted to be there early to you know help the bride and do all that kind of happy business and um, 
we got there and my little brother needed dress shoes. So we're, we're like, okay, we'll go to the wedding. Mom will hang out with the bride and me and my dad, my brother, will take him back to town and find some dress shoes for him, get back in time for the wedding. So we, we go get him some shoes or patent leather, brown, ugly shoes. You never, as a kid, you never want to wear them. You got to wear them to the wedding. Um, so we're driving back and dad notices a garage sale. Now these days, dad is all about the sales. You know, he'll go out to a, a garage sale. He'll go out all day to a, you know, any kind of sale. Sale, he's there. He's going to go check out. He's going to look through all the junk. He knows what everything is. Me, I'm just like sniffing in the corners looking for comic books, right? So he might have known about this. He might have seen it in the newspaper or something. But anyway, we see the garage sale on the way back. And he's like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll stop off and see what they got. So we get out of the car. I'm like, yeah, hopefully they got some comic books, right? And we walk up, and this guy has a picnic table covered stacks of comic books. I'm like, hmm, hmm, comic books. Mm. My mouth started watering. And I was like, oh, cool. He's got he's got stuff like this. And I started pilfering through and. It's got stuff like this. Well, so how, how much are you selling your comic books for, sir? Quarter a piece. I'll tell you what. I'll let you have all of it for hundred dollars. I'm like, Dad. Instant collection, Dad. Hundred bucks. Come on, I'll 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 give you my my allowance for life. No. Here's eight bucks. So I keep meandering through. I find stuff like this. Like, oh, that's cool. That's before, that's in between the 136 and 148. And stuff like that. I'm like, oh. Could, could, he, could he have a 137? Could I get that lucky? We had stuff like this. The ones in the Mylar's are the ones I'm keeping. The ones in the polys, they're a little bit rough for my shape, so I'll be upgrading them eventually. 142. Oh, 142. That's closer to 137. Never mind the autographs for now. This one's got a serious spine roll, but other than that, it's in good shape. That's 139. That's issue after 138, which I've got, and I need 137. Oh. He had it. I got it for a quarter. Oh, the whole glorious death of the Phoenix. The most shocking event in Marvel Comics in decades. I had my grail, my white whale. I had landed it. But wait, that's not all. So I had a trade paperback of the Dark Phoenix Saga. It was one of the first trades that Marvel ever did. So I was like, oh, he's got the 137. I'll take it home. But if he's got a bunch of other X-Men, I don't really need the Dark Phoenix Saga. I got that in a trade. I'll take whatever else he's got. Like that one. 126. 125. If you're keeping track, $8 at a quarter a piece. That's 32 bucks. A couple daredevils thrown in. I didn't pull out the, the annuals. I'm pretty sure I got two annuals. Alpha flight. Do the math. Figure out how far back we're going. 119. <clears throat> I don't know what it was that the even number ones are a little bit rougher than the odd number ones. These all were in kind of crusty poly bags. 
had sticker prices on them from the used bookstore we did have in town that sold comics and I think there were like six, eight, ten, twelve dollar sticker prices on them. The bag seemed old though. 114. I showed the upgrade for that one in one of my bids. This one's really beat. One twelve, one eleven. How far back will it go? One ten. Of course, if you're a Wolverine fan, you know what good old one oh nine was. One oh eight. And I think by that time I had known that John Byrne's first issue was 108. I knew that somehow. So I was like, I guess I'll kind of pick and choose beyond this. Um, I wish I'd gotten more, but one of them I pick and chose. Well, that one. And this one had a big two marked across the whole cover um, but it was in like grease pencil so I started watching YouTube videos and people were talking about cleaning their comics and I was like I'm, I'm familiar with the concept of an eraser so I just started chipping at it in the white spots and I did okay until I started going over some of the color and I got the grease marker off pretty well but I did wear some some light spots into some of the color but I did it because this wasn't like a key issue it, it wasn't the death of Thunderbird or anything like that man I wish I hadn't done that I mean the, the damage I did isn't terribly serious I'm, I doubt I'm going to upgrade this book it's good enough for me. So, along the way, I, I've gone in. The, the, cop, the copies I've shown you are the copies I bought off the rack of the 136 and 138. I've, I've upgraded the 136. It's not mint. It's, real, it's very nice. J Hood Creative grading scale. Very nice. One thirty-eight here. It's also very nice. Got a couple spine ticks, not too bad. Chris Claremont autograph. I told him a story about reading the end, saying, "Yeah, I remember reading it, and the end of the issue said the end, so I thought the book was canceled." And he looked at me, kind of like, "You fool!" He opened it up, and it says, "It doesn't say the end. It says the beginning." I was like. Yeah, I was 11. So I've replaced 137, or not replaced. I'm not going to get rid of that one. But I've upgraded it. And it's not, not mint either. It's not, it's nice. Not very nice. It's nice. With a press, could get to very nice. So there's that. And along the way, as I've gotten, done my autograph hunting, Again, I'm sure I started getting this. I got this first autograph in here in 1989 or 1990. Back then, they didn't sign the covers, they signed underneath the indicia. And if you can see, we got autographs. The first one was John Byrne. And Chris Claremont, Jim Shooter, and Terry Austin, too. And you know, if there was ever one book that I wish I would have gotten Stan Lee to sign, this one would have been it, probably. He had very little to do with it, but it's all these other awesome autographs on it. That's the only one I ever feel like I'm missing. But. 137. Level achieved. The 136, I might have said this in another video, I'm not sure. Well, the 136 and the 138 and the 148 have done for this comic book reader 
at the time, just general consumer, is it hooked me into this idea of there's a lot out there. There's a lot to go find, a lot to go collect, a lot to enjoy. And I don't think we give Chris Claremont and John Byrne enough credit for hooking that whole generation into the X-Men, drawing them in to keep them coming back to find issue after issue, to go find, hunt them down. Chris Claremont went on to write the X-Men for years after that. And the, the, the quality of the stories were just kind of up and down, kind of ebbed and flowed. When he had a, it seemed like when he had better artists on, the book got better. But yeah, it's those these handful, three, two, three, four books that hooked me as a collector for a lifetime. That really spun it around from, hey, just hunt and peck for an issue off the off the spinner rack to, gotta have them all. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give I gotta find them. I gotta hunt for them. I gotta go out, kill it, bring it back home. So. That's my X-Men origin story. Thanks for sticking around to hear it. Um, I've really been looking forward to, to sharing that with you guys in the world. So That's it. Remember, faith, family, comic books. We'll see you next time.